I, from what I experienced working with SAC and the community, it has brought in pride of who we are. And I understand that um, the Inuktitut dialogues, some of us were starting to forget, has brought it back to us. And I also heard from certain parents that it encouraged their children to take out a frying pan or wooden spoon and drum dance. And it also has um, brought back traditional tattoos. When we did that on Arjoit, um, we did not know of anyone who knew who has tattoos. And so from my own experience, I was learning about tattoos because of Watanal Jwad and this shaman apprentice had also uh, made me understand that urine was important protector for spiritual journey and I also learned that um, when shamans practice shamanism, um, you have to be confident about uh, your journey you're about to experience. As the elder said in there that if, if you're scared, it will sense your fear and you could be bitten or um, eaten. And I've, as a kid, I've always heard of um, legends and storytelling through my parents, from my parents, including Kanaluk. In here, it's the woman who lives underground. And to see it on an animation was beautiful because I've always imagined it in my own memories or imagination. So to have Zach Rias to put it in to an animation and to use our voice to, to act it out, even though my dialogues were minimal, to feel it and to see it as we were making it was beautiful in a way that I never imagined I would have practiced or think of being in that moment. And my aunt was my big helper and always have been in all our films when I don't know the old terminology because today's world in our age and younger, our Inuktitut is much more modern than it was compared to my parents' time. So sometimes my aunt, I'll ask her or my birth mom, how would you say this in, in uh, Inuktitut, the original language of Inuktitut? And I may have it in today's life, uh, like, for example, I said to my aunt, Kapiasukuvit, which means if you're scared. And she said the original wording is, Kuksukuvit. See, the, this is what I mean, the film that we make uh, in process of writing it. Um, because when we submit an application to funders, it's usually in English. And then we, of course, we write it in Inuktitut and then turn it into English. And the dialogues we rewrite in the original language. Um, thanks to our elders, we get help and improve the Inuktitut that way. So it's, uh, it's always a teaching for me and our younger crew. And I double check with my elders, is this accurate if I say it this way? And sometimes, or most times, in every script I worked on, we would improve it in the original language of 
our dialect, which is in the Baffin region, North Baffin, in Italy. I hope that answered your question. Mm -hmm. Hi. It's a beautiful film. I have many questions, but maybe I'll just ask one. The young apprentice doesn't speak. She's very quiet. And I know, or I understand in traditional Inuit culture, you learn by watching and not so much asking questions or dialogue. Could you talk a little bit about that? Because I found that very powerful. Yes. Thank you for the question. Um, ever since I was a kid, uh, I've always been an observer and or body language. I grew up with my grandparents, so it was I was one of the younger generations that learned the traditional way of living. We grew up in on the land every summer from the last day of school to the like one week after the school started. So none of my childhood were in the community. And so I I'm glad to say that um, it is true. Most of the time it is body language and facial expressions and reading energy around you. I, I feel that in younger generation, because we're taught English in school, most of the days we're learning European way of education, but I would say that if Inuktitut was practiced more in our school, in our curriculum, I think we may have kept it longer, but nowadays I'm noticing the younger children are very energetic and talkative versus from our time when we were children, where we were expected to respect the elders, respect the older people. You don't talk back to older people and you don't start fight. And this generation, I'm noticing um, they tend to talk back to elders. They tend to argue, unnecessary argument. Um, so I think from my own experience, the more you pay attention and the more you listen and take time for the person to speak, you either use your energy to respond or to, if it's from my parents' perspective, um, is it worth answering or is it unnecessary to answer? For an example, if I have an argument with my older sister. It, is it, does it make sense to bring up my answer or is it better to stay quiet? So uh, this isn't practiced as much in, in modern day. Um, and my mother's message to me as a kid was um, I came home from school and I was crying because I've been bullied and uh, I was explaining that my English wasn't good enough and the classmate was teasing me saying my English was horrible and so my mother said so is it worth it to fight back or is it should you take a moment and be proud of your Inuktitut language so that, as an example, was my way. It, it made me think. I was raised as a, if I go to my parents, I'm crying or complaining. Someone did something. She or my father would take a mo give me a moment to think of um, why. What did I do to get that bully? So it they would. The rule in Inuktitut, Inuit culture, is you don't um, take side of your child when she's watching or when he's watching. And if you must 
wait for the child to be away and talk to the parent of that child who did the bullying. Uh, because in our belief that if we react in front of the child, we're also bringing the child to be a bully because he or she will know the mom or dad will defend. So if she or he reacts, then um, she has this idea of, well, I'm going to tell my parent and you're going to get heck for it. In, in, instead, my parents raised me, well, what did you do? And I was thinking, well, did I tease? Did I? And if I didn't tease or if I didn't do anything but got bullied anyway, her answer was walk away. And I was like, how could you just walk away? <laughs> so our mind has swift to switch to European way, I think, because in school, from kindergarten to grade three, we're taught in Inuktitut, and then four to grade 12 and college and high school, uh, university, it's all in English. So, yeah, the silence, you, um, I'm trying to teach my children, is it worth it to give your energy, is it worth it to respond? Of course, as a teenager, I was like, if you bully me, guess what I'm going to do? <laughs> but those moments, my parents would tell me, is it worth it to fight back? Or should you just walk away? Yeah. So silence can mean powerful, like you said, or not responding, but it takes practice. Yeah. There are questions I don't think they can be answered. Like, um, does he confess? He sits up. What is the taboo that is broken? And the final question that the grandmother asks, what have you learned? And we don't hear an answer. So all of this is left for us to think. But I do have a much more literal minded question, which is before they descend to the underworld, they enter what appears to be, well, an igloo. But inside, it's not an igloo. It's got wood and uh, stone walls and so on. What's that going on there? So when we built the Qarmaq back in the day, uh, to, uh, to um, windproof it, they would put snow on top of it. Qarmaq is the sod house. And there's a gra uh, rocks to film the board, the bottom of the 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 wall is out of the rocks, and then there's the bowhead whale bone as a uh, a stone, and then uh, back then caribou hide, and then they would put snow on top of that to protect the wind from going through. It was like a protect, uh, windproof protector. And um, there's no um, English subtitle. When the grandmother asked, what did you learn? And my character remembers, Kinauvit, which means, who are, uh, who are you? So the young woman is thinking, what did I just learn and what do I need to carry from what I just learned? And when we were working on this, like you, I was asking Zacharias, so what did, what did he say? <laughs> but my aunt said to me, sometimes the person doesn't have to say anything and the shaman would understand. So it's up to the shaman to, to re get the reply. So for the audience, we wonder, so, so what happened? But it's, it's our own, it's the beauty of making films is the audience, you, you make them wonder. And it's for your imagination to create your answer. And 
I think the shaman grandmother knows. And did he respond? I don't know. <laughs> but um, I'd like to say yes. <laughs> It is that traditionally, um, before Christianity came to our lands in 1921, um, Inuit were very um, strict in sharing. You share what you catch and you don't take something for yourself only. And so the person, the hunter, caught the polar bear and he ate the tongue to himself. And that tongue is the caribou tongue, the polar bear tongue. I love caribou tongue. But the polar bear tongue itself is also um, uh, in Alunati. Uh, hmm? Delicate, yeah, delicacy. And so he, he had it to himself only and not share it with his family. So it, be, it made him sick that he didn't share. So in our culture, when someone catches an animal for the first time, she or he is not supposed to have a bite, but to share it within the, the village or the community or the family. And the second catch or any time after that, he or she can have a bite. So if this gentleman who caught the polar bear and had the tongue to himself, that's what caused him from getting sick because he did not share it and the spirits, uh, the polar bear spirit and the human spirit, we are all connected in our belief and the water is important, the land is important, the sun, it, we're all part of the universe and if one doesn't share and is stingy, then it can create a sickness within us. Mm. Mm. I know that Atanarjwat was based on multiple Inuit legends that were sort of woven together. And I wanted to ask, for this movie, was it something similar? Or was it based on one story? Or is it just sort of an original idea? It was... Zacharias's recollection of an elder, local elder story of how shamans were practicing their beliefs at the time. Because when Christianity came, it was banned to have no practice of shamanism. Drum dancing was banned, traditional throat singing was banned, tattoos were banned in our area. And so uh, for a long time, Inuit were against shamanism because they were brainwashed that we will go to devil or evil or hell, whatever it is. But in our culture, um, some of us were still curious to learn shamanism and so collecting it from Panea, an elder from our hometown. He asked for Panea's permission to uh, make it into an animation. And to say Atanarjuat legend, I would specify that the legend that we used in um, the Fast Runner, his name was originally Atanarjuat and is from Iglulik and he ran all the way to Siwarjuk. So the original storytelling itself was also from Panea. And um, different communities or different regions may have slightly changed the story, but the story itself is from uh, uh, Panea, who is our elder. So it wasn't from different people, it was from particular elder from our hometown. So has ch the church or younger generations lost that kind of that taboo, that fear of learning about shamanism? Or is this kind of still 
still present? Because, I mean, these films obviously are, are reclaiming that tradition beautifully, mm -hmm. artistically, through stories, films. Um, so the young people, are they starting to look to this and being curious, or is there still a lot of uh, fear or taboo? Both. Um, I can speak for my community, um, but it may be different from different communities. Uh, this particular film, this animation, The Shaman's Apprentice, had opened up some um, talking within the community. It's okay to, to hear about our shaman history or ancestors because for a long time we were not allowed to talk about shamanism. We were not allowed to ask questions about shamans and when we did the film, the journals of Knut Rasmussen, Ava is my mother's grandfather. So in their bloodline, in our bloodline, I learned through the research of Ava's family why I went to my biological parents and I asked, why did we not talk about shamanism and their response was we were told not to talk about it and it took a while for my mother to comfortably answer my questions because I refused to stop asking until she gave me some answers the first time second time third time she would change the subject because she was she made a promise to God in European church, maybe, that yes, I will not talk about shamanism anymore. And the, the, we don't practice the, the, like, only through research, thanks to Zacharias, I often like to thank him to give me the courage to want to ask, to ask our elders. And when they're not asked, they don't talk about it. Only when they are asked, they're proud to share it. And sometimes my mother is very Christian and she will pray before she gives an answer. Where in my generation, I have a sibling who dare not speak about shamanism and she's two years older than me and younger sisters and brothers who refuse to ask because they fear. I'm the one who tends to ask and I have asked my uncles who are elders and have gone to the spirit world but I maybe because I grew up with my grandparents and heard legends and stories of the past, I don't have that, oh, if I go to, if I talk about shamanism, I will go to hell. My, in my thinking, well, for millennia, if my ancestors were practicing it and my parents were loved, they showed love, they shared their food there. If someone comes to our house, they serve tea, whatever ethnic background they may, they may be. I was raised to not judge the person by his or her color or sexuality. I was told and raised to respect everyone equally and so and they would often tell me stories when we were on the land about um, Kanaluk, the one who lives underground, about um, Sedna in English, um, about Iraid and Tarexuit, which are uh, supernatural beings from the from the land and so growing up with that as a kid 
and seeing my parents and uncles because we would always have family camps for two to three months. And they practiced drum dancing and I never saw any negativity in it. So I feel safe to, to research, I think. Um, of course, I asked for my grandparents' guidance before I ask and or protection. Um, I strongly believe that uh, this, this is our, the way I was raised. We are, uh, in, if I translate it, it's like we're borrowing our body, the physical form. And when we leave, we're in the spiritual form. So I was raised to, to have respect and to, and if I don't, it comes back to me. So that's the fear of living. If, if you're mean to your fellows, that mean energy can come back to you and even can be worse than what you give. So again, in sharing food, if you share your food, the spirits of those animals you catch will, be, will know you're sharing through the energy of the universe and or human being, the flesh. So, as I said earlier, we're all connected one way or another. And if I give negative energy, that negative energy can come back. And if I don't share my food, it's hard for me to catch food. And so if I share my country food, the more I share, the more welcoming the animals would be. And most times when I travel to present films or I've gone to many places to present films and so sometimes an atheist or vegetarian will be like, well, how come you still eat meat? You can survive without meat. And I'm like, have you gone up north? <laughs> <laughs> because the weather is so different from our in the south and yeah uh, and we don't waste the food because again we believe that if you waste the food you'll have a hard time catching the the animal to feed your family so you share what you catch and you eat what you get and we use the the hide for uh, clothing uh, back in the day it was also for tent and for films, we, we still make the tents out of seal skin hide and we still use the caribou hide for bedding, even in modern day. But we don't n often see caribou tents now, uh, seal skin hide tents now. It's often canvas tents. And uh, we still use the uh, kamik, which are made out of seal skin. And we still use caribou hide if we're going out camping, but in the winter time. But um, most times younger generation buy very expensive outfits from the stores or order online. And we live in modern world. So. Yeah. My answers get long. <laughs> Hi. I, I think it, it's a very interesting question that she had because, you know, this is something that's happening not only in your community, but everywhere in the world that we're modernity. We cannot go against the, what's happening with modernization and the effect it has throughout everywhere, you know. I think about, like, the people that, you know, I, I was born in El Salvador and I have... Uh, Part of me is I have ancestry that is native, you know, from this, but you know, from this continent. But you know, you have all these autochthonous people that used to practice shamanism, and it was because it was like a sort of like a, a, a philosophy of life, and everything goes together with it, right? And you know, I was just mentioning to Anika there that I, I, I saw a movie uh, about uh, um, shamanist uh, communities in. Eastern uh, Siberia, like in the in this uh, Russia, 
uh, but it's very interesting because uh, you see the um, the very similarities that's, that are happening with the communities, you know, and the belief of uh, nomadic communities that are moving around and, you know, they believe in that connection, the holistic way, right? Which is something probably we could actually all benefit from, you know, unfortunately we live in a capitalist system where, you know, everything is money, 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 and that's the primary thing, right? Me, myself, and I, right? So I think it's very interesting that you're sharing this, and I think I really would like to thank you as well. And I've, I've been actually enjoying all these events because it brings back a lot of things and connectedness to what we're all suffering in this planet, you know? Mm. Uh, unfortunately, things like that change, and, you know, I, sometimes I wonder, you know, but, but the fact is that we're still s surviving and we're still together and we're here, you know, and we're forming community. And what you're saying is something very important is we're all part of something, you know, and we're all linked together, right? And mm -hmm. community is what makes us be happy, right? Mm -hmm. Part of it, I think. So I really like to thank you uh, for this event. And I just find it really fascinating and touching. It's, a, it's an honor, actually, to, mm -hmm. to hear you. It's beautiful, yeah. Queen. Thank you. I often like to use an example when 9-11 happened in New York, people helped each other. Why can't we often help each other when, even if it's not a tragedy, how come we can't be humans with each other? But if it, events like that happen, nobody judges and they want to help. And it's, it, I use that as, as an example because I still remember today, today we were in Toronto ready to present at 1,500 seats were all sold out. And my cousins and I were getting ready. And I went to get my hair done like at 9 a.m. I was so excited. And I come out around 10 and I go into our hotel. It was our first time to be all in a city about six of us actors and our director Zacharias and uh, producer Norman Cohn. And I come in, little Inuk from a small town. Hey, did you see the big action movie? The plane crashed to the Twin Tower. And everyone was silent and I was looking around and I said to Norman, that was the most action movie ever. And again, everyone is silent and Norman face and expression, and I was like, okay, what's happening? And he said, that was live. And then here, news after news after news. It was on TV all day. Our show was canceled. We were in a panic because we were able to see a bit of the flame all the way from Toronto. And Toronto is one of the biggest cities in Canada. We were wondering, is Toronto next? Are we going to be able to go home? Are we going to die today? So the few days of our cancelled flights, cancelled flights, cancelled flights, we were seeing many people helping each other in New York. And we were also supporting each other, even strangers. Okay, it's going to be okay. We will be okay. Trying to encourage each other. We'll be okay. We'll be fine. We'll go home. And you go to the airport, you line up, we were lining up for hours and hours, and then we would have to go back to our hotel because there's no flights for many days. It took me about one week to get back to my home. And I use that as an example is when a tragic happens, we tend to open up and love, but how come we don't practice it on a daily basis? And when there is hate and fight, nobody feels good about that, but ego takes over. So in Inuit culture, for a long time, we would rather avoid fight. And if there was fight, they would try, they would try and solve it with, okay, how, what can we do to help each other instead of fighting because Survival is what we, what we had, and even today. Mm. 
Any more questions? Yes. Um, we were chatting earlier about your research on shamanism, and you said you were traveling to Ottawa tomorrow to interview and speak with uh, an Inuit elder about his, you know, knowledge and experience. So I thought the audience might be interested in knowing what you're doing and how they can tune in, because you said it was going to be broadcast. Um, that might be in to do though, but um, I just thought, you know, since everyone's so interested in the shamanism and what you're explaining, that they might want to know. Mm. So tomorrow I'll do two things. One is to interview an elder who is originally from Nauyat in Repulse Bay, and he openly talks about shamanism and why we should not feel ashamed to talk about shamanism. And so I'll go to Ottawa to go interview him for my documentary. And during the daytime, I will go on live show with Genova, who makes um, uh, cutting boards and uses uh, Inuit tattoos to design her cutting boards. So two things, um, if I confused you that the elder will go on live. This one is for a documentary, but the live show will be about a young uh, Inuk who makes cutting boards. Her boyfriend gets the trees from his dad's land and he cuts the he cuts them into squares and sands them and use um, he varnishes it and then my sister applies, uh, he, she burns it into, burns and designs it into traditional tattoos and sells them uh, at a reasonable price. <laughs> and I'm so proud of her. For a very long time we didn't know much about tattoos and so Atanal Joet had brought in curiosity of us younger, I'd like to say young, <laughs> of us um, to, to be proud of our tattoos because for a very long time, maybe 80 years, it wasn't practiced in our region. And Alethea, I'd like to mention her name because she was one of the first ones who took it back and made a documentary called To Neat. And I coordinated her visit in Iglulik and connected her with elders who have seen tr traditional facial tattoo when they were young. Rachel Uyarasuk, who sings in the beginning of shamanism, uh, the shaman apprentice, I mean. Um, so uh, last year, I got this year, this spring, I got my own markings. I I wanted to get them right after Atanal Joet and there was someone who said I'll break up with you and I was like okay I won't do it but I I know who I am now and I know that I'm proud of who I am and so I told him at the time okay when I when I become a grandmother I'm going to regardless if you like it or not and I did become my grandma, and so I had my first markings. Mm. <laughs> yes. And also. I would love to finish it off, but there's no more questions. My grandfather's song. And our grandfather's name was Kapianak. Ya 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 
translation goes, it's the song of his near starvation when he was about six years old. He, the first lyrics go, There was moments where I was almost near blackout because of the things I needed to do. He's inside an igloo and he's sitting, listening, hoping to hear something nearby. Are you able to see any sign out here in the universe? He's outside his igloo searching. Are you able to hear something from out here? So my aunt, I asked my mother, my father's sister, um, after my parents passed away, my aunts passed away, my uncles passed away, I thought to myself, I will, I need to carry this song and I asked my aunt, can you teach me this song? And she said, how dare you ask? And I was silent, hoping that she would answer. And when the parent and elder says, how dare you, you stay, you don't fight back, you, get, you don't ask again. And so I'm sitting next to her for a good maybe two minutes of silent. And she goes, I won't sing it to you, but if you really want to learn it, you will get the rhythm one day, but I'll tell you the story. And her story, she goes, when my father was young, who is also the father of my father, he was about six years old, sitting inside the igloo, and he would listen from outside. He would try and wake up his parents, his mom and dad, his two older brothers, and they would not wake up. Being six years old, he's trying again and again. These people, he thinks they're all sleeping. And he would listen outside, no sound. And he would go outside and search any signs of human or dog team, no, no one near. And he would listen again and no sound. It turned out he was getting black dog from being starving. And one day an old man, the, uh, an elder came, his name was Angutim Marik. Angutim Marik is translated to a real man, a masculine. Angutim Marik had peeked in the igloo, which he thought was abandoned, and he hears a little sound, 
and he's learned that my great grandparents and my great uncles had passed from starvation and this young little boy who was six at the time was the only survivor and so when he became an adult he made this song and I often like to share it when I'm given invitation because my aunt said that time I was sitting beside her and she refused to share it in, in, in the song form. She said, today people use it without our permission from our family and they make it wrong. They say, they sing it wrong. And she said, if you learn it, if you really want to learn it, the Spirit can guide you to sing it. And thanks to Zacharias again, he recorded my aunt, two aunties, my father's sisters, and they sang it. And so I would rewind it and play it and rewind it and play it. And I learned it thanks to our old recordings. And I promised my aunt that if I did learn it, I would sing it and make sure it was correct. Mm. Thank you.